Hello, film historians. I'm Derek, and I love old movies. We've got Sam the Sidekick here. Hello, and welcome to episode 41. Or, for those of you scoring along at home, episode 1 of season 3. 20 episodes a season seems about right. Yeah, except in season 1, we actually did 21, mm, yeah. but 1 was a bonus episode, right. so what the heck. You know, I feel like we did a bonus episode in season 2 as well, but somehow it was still only 20 episodes. Oh, right. Rebecca was weirdly numbered. Yeah, episode 25.5. Yeah. Well, regardless, this is 41, and everything is as it should be. Now, kind of a big week, would you say? Yeah, a bit. As some of you might know by now, we crossed the 10,000 listen mark last week, so that was kind of huge. And you kind of stepped out from behind the microphone and in front of a camera for something pretty neat. A little bit, yeah. Sam is, of course, among other things, an aspiring actress. She's been auditioning for different things for a while now, and last weekend shot her first commercial, and that whole experience was pretty incredible. Is that fair to say? Fair to say. We can't say too much more about it right now since it's still in production and hasn't been released yet. But it was very cool to get to do, and when it hits, we'll be sure to tell you. Hey, check this out. All right. So let's do some business and then get down to business. So business number one, thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. We love watching these films and chatting about them for you. It's a lot of fun. That's totally true. And we love hearing from you also. So if you've ever got ideas or suggestions for us, say maybe you can think of some films we should do or some aspects of films you'd rather see us consider. Let us know. Also, if you'd like to read a cold open for the podcast. Oh, yeah. Maybe talking about a nostalgic or formative experience you had watching movies? Get in touch, and let's make that happen right away. You don't have to have come from a small town in the Ottawa Valley. But bonus points if you did. And if you could, please take a moment, right now, to hit like, subscribe, and share. Especially share. The sharing is the big one. Or if you were on an audio-only platform, see about dropping us some stars and maybe even a quick review. You'd be surprised how much that sort of thing really helps. And then... If you are looking for something fun to do this weekend, why not check us out on the socials? Why not indeed? After all, we are on the Facebook. I Love Old Movies, the podcast. Le Instagram. At I Love Old Movies, the podcast. L Twitter. At ILOM podcast. And the good old fashioned email. I Love Old Movies, the podcast at gmail.com. All one word. And of course, you should also do what all the cool kids do, which is pet the rock. And by that, we mean head on over to petrockradio.ca to listen to amazing local web-based radio programming with fantastic music and previous episodes of our show broadcast three times a week. Monday, Saturday, and Sunday. Come for the music, stay for the podcasts. We'll link that for you in the description. So, are you all set to survive a shipwreck and awaken in a land where everyone is the size of your thumb? Be five fo fum, baby. Uh, that's the wrong giant. <laughs> I don't care. Hit the music. Our director is Dave Fleischer. Fleischer worked as a film cutter in 1913 for a French film production and distribution company. He then partnered with his brother Max in 1921 to start their first studio, out of the Inkwell Films Incorporated. Fleischer supervised the production of many cartoons, including Betty Boop and Popeye the Sailor. After their first film, Gulliver's Travels, was released, Fleischer Studios became indebted to Paramount Pictures due to cost overruns on the film and a recent poorly received cartoon series, resulting in Fleischer Studios eventually becoming temporary surrender to Paramount in 1941. Superman was the most successful cartoon series for Fleischer Studios, but unfortunately, weaker cartoons began being produced in 1940 as Dave Fleischer took control of production. He resigned in 1941 and quickly became a producer for Screen Gems at Columbia Pictures. He produced Song of Victory and Imagination, which were both nominated for Academy Awards. He continued to work on different productions over the years, eventually working at Republic Pictures and Universal, before ending his career with 542 directorial credits. Fleischer died in 1979 at the age of 84. The writer is Dan Gordon. Gordon began his animation career as a story man at Van Buren Studios, and by 1936, he received a director's credit there. 
This was where he first collaborated with Joe Barbara, and the two went to work for MGM in 1937. After helping to rewrite the film Gulliver's Travels, Gordon also worked on the 1941 hit of the Superman animated series. Gordon remained at Fleischer Studios, eventually called Famous Studios, to work on a couple Popeye shorts and The Hungry Goat in 1943. Gordon later collaborated with Joe Barbara and Bill Hanna to create storyboards for many cartoon classics, including Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear, and Oggy Doggy. Bill Hanna himself has even stated that Gordon was essential to the creation of the Flintstones cartoon. Gordon remained working for Hanna-Barbera until his death in 1970 at the age of 68. Hinto Kolvig, one of the biggest names in voice work that you might never have heard of, plays the role of Gabby in our film. With a nickname that comes from his childhood freckles and an array of talent in miming, mimicry, and music, Kolvig worked in circuses and on vaudeville stages and in bands to scratch out a living. But in 1916, Kolvig began to work at the Animated Film Corporation, which was producing cartoons years before Walt Disney would. And in 1917, he produced Pinto's Prisma Comedy Review, which was considered to be the first color cartoon. This film is lost, sadly. In the 1920s, he moved to Hollywood, working on screen in silent comedies and as an animator for cartoon shorts under Max Sennett. And then he worked under Walter Lance, even voicing Lance's pre-Woody Woodpecker character, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Kolvig worked for Walt Disney after that as a writer and doing voice work, and becoming closely associated with the company until a falling out with Disney sent him to work for the Fleischers, just in time for the production of Gulliver's Travels. Disney didn't replace him in the characters he was most famous for portraying, and essentially held those roles until his eventual return. Over the course of his career, Kolvig voiced Bluto in the Popeye shorts, not one, but two of the Seven Dwarfs, sleepy and grumpy if you are wondering, Pluto, although those were more vocalizations than voice, but was probably best known for being the voice of Goofy in a great many Disney cartoons. And that would probably be considered a very full career for many, but Kolvig went on to become the singing voice of Daffy Duck not the speaking one, in The Bugs Bunny Show, which ran from 1960 to 1972. Along the way, he was also Bozo the Clown, appearing in records and on television. An acclaimed and accomplished voice actor, perhaps overlooked as a result of some of the bigger-name contemporaries around, like Mel Blanc, Pinto Kolvig died in 1967 at the age of 75. He was honored as a Disney legend by the Walt Disney Company in 1993 and is a 2004 inductee into the Clown Hall of Fame. There's regrettably not much to say about Sam Parker, who won a contest to play Lemuel Gulliver both as a voice actor and a rotoscope model. But please bear in mind that since this is a celebrity who doesn't even have so much as a Wikipedia page, finding many details might be tough. What we do know is that Parker was a radio announcer by profession, and the contest he wound up winning was, in fact, a radio contest. That sounds a bit fishy. Yeah, and yet, it also sounds like the most showbiz thing ever. <laughs> yeah. Parker, though, was not able to translate his Gulliver role into a major career in Hollywood voice work. After the film, he only lent his voice to cartoons four more times a Fleischer short called The Foul Ball Player, and three episodes of Superman. His last bit of credited work is in 1943, so it's reasonable to assume he just stayed on radio after that. Who knows? Do you know? Let us know. Sam Parker died in 1986 at the age of 79. A feature-length animated film was a top-of-mind idea for Max Fleischer, and he wanted to work on one as early as 1934. And had he started then, Gulliver's Travels might have hit screens before Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And in some ways that might have been better. But then, the original plan was to call it Popeye's Travels and have Gulliver replaced by Popeye, so who knows how any of that would have turned out. Probably about the same, but with Popeye, really. I guess when you compare the two films, the comparison isn't that flattering. Oh, you'll see. Paramount wanted no part of the risk of an animated film until Snow White came out and was a huge success. Then they came back to the Fleischers and gave him the green light, 
And they said, well, since Snow White took 18 months to produce, you need to turn in Gulliver's Travels in 18 months. And go. Well, that just seems fair. The goal was a Christmas 1939 release, right? Yeah. Problem was, sure, Snow White took 18 months to animate and film. But that was after 18 months of pre-production and development. Gulliver's Travels wasn't getting that lead time. And to further complicate things, this contract came in right when the Fleischers were moving their studio to Florida. So we're in the middle of a move. Yeah. And have half as much time needed to complete a film by deadline. Yeah. How did they solve that little problem? Easy. Just hire people. More people? Way more people. Fleischer's staff swelled to nearly 800. They hired local art students. They hired people away from Hollywood and even poached some Disney employees. But the delays were still a problem. So much so that Paramount wanted to cancel the whole thing at several points, especially as costs began to soar. Oh, those penny-pinching studio executives didn't like that so much. No. So this sounds it was a monumental challenge for the Fleischers. How did they do? Well, where the Fleischer Studios excelled at filmmaking was in the actual technical aspects of animation. They were very imaginative, creative, even innovative. Where they were weak overall, though, was in storytelling and in the presentation of characters. Gulliver's Travels is an interesting film in that it displays Fleischer's strengths and weaknesses together, almost seamlessly. Poor storytelling and weak characters weren't as big an issue in a five-minute short about a cow dancing through a meadow, for instance. But in a feature-length film intended to be a response to Snow White, it was going to be a problem. Was it? How did audiences like it? Actually, considering the fact that it had already been outclassed in every measurable way three years before its release by Snow White, and considering its main box office competition was a little film called The Wizard of Oz, Gulliver's Travels did great. It was a financial hit and made a ton of cash. Cha-ching for the Fleischers. No, not really. See, they'd gone over budget and production, so Paramount penalized them with financial penalties, preventing them from really reaping the benefits they had coming. And this was the beginning of the ongoing financial problems that would trouble Fleischer Studios right until the end. So this film created a financial hole they could never really climb out of? Gulliver's Travels might well have been subtitled The Beginning of the End. The long, slow, painful end. Oof. What's the tale of the tape on this one, Sam? Okay, so we have a 6.6 on IMDb. Mm-hmm. The audience score is 53% on Rotten Tomatoes, Ooh. and the tomato meter is 69%. Yeah. The film was nominated for Oscars for Best Original Song and Best Original Score. And the film can be watched on YouTube or Amazon Prime Video. When the kings of Lilliput and Blefuscu sign an agreement to marry their children together and unify their countries, Gabby the town crier has made an astonishing discovery. There is a giant on the beach. The giant is in fact Lemuel Gulliver, the survivor of a shipwreck. While Gulliver lies unconscious on the beach, Gabby tries to alert everyone to his presence. The kings argue about which national anthem is to be played at the wedding, leading to now only a failed marriage agreement but also a war between the two nations. And with focus off of planning a wedding, Gabby leads an angry mob to the beach to capture the giant. You love angry mobs. The angrier, the better. (laughs) Yeah. How'd that uh, Oxbow incident work out for you? No! Don't bring that up! The Lilliputians wrap Gulliver in a massive web of ropes and devices, but Gulliver instantly breaks free the moment he awakens. The Lilliputians are like, oh crap, and at that moment the Blefuscu fleet arrives, opening fire on the city, leading to even more, oh crap. Gulliver is not daunted by this, even going so far as to laugh at the tiny cannonballs and arrows incoming from the boats. King Bombo of Blefuscu has no wish to fight a giant and orders a retreat, and this gets King Little thinking, hmm, what if we weaponize this big guy? Suddenly, there's no more, let's tie this guy up, and way more, let's treat him with the utmost hospitality. King Bombo has spies in Lilliput, and he orders them to kill Gulliver. Gulliver is treated like a hero in Lilliput, and one night, when the Prince of Blefuscu sneaks in to see the Princess of Lilliput, Gulliver helps them get together for a quiet moment alone. 
They tell him of the problem with the national anthems, and he suggests combining their anthems into one song. So obvious. Why didn't anyone else think of that? Well, you know how issues of national intrigue go. The three spies have obtained Gulliver's pistol and are planning on using it to kill him. Bombo orders a final attack on Lilliput, but Gabby intercepts the attack order so the Lilliputian army is prepared. When the attack fleet arrives, Gulliver demands their peaceful withdrawal. But they instead open fire. Their cannons and arrows do nothing, and Gulliver ties all the ships together and drags them to shore, beaching them. The spies prepare to shoot Gulliver, but the prince foils them, although he appears to fall to his doom in the process. With the prince dead, Gulliver lectures them on the pointlessness of their battle. The kings agree, and then, ta-da! Psych! The prince is really alive, and he and the princess sing their combined anthem for everyone. The war is over, the wedding will be back on, and everyone builds a boat for Gulliver, and he sails off, literally into the sunset. Uh, that's it? What about the other places he travels to in the book? Not here. What about all the political commentary and satire? Nope. Almost everything that makes Gulliver's Travels a classic of literature. Completely not a part of this movie? The giant people? No. The horse people? No. The floating islands? Nope. Okay, well, I guess then that was 77 minutes we spent watching a film. Let's spend the next 10 or so prone conning this baby. That's what we do. All right, then. As always, we don't actually rate films here on the show. There are no stars. There are no thumbs. We just tell you some things we liked. Some things we didn't. And then we recommend whether or not you might enjoy giving this one a watch. Take it away. My pros. Number one. There's a lot of imagination on display here. The animators have found really creative ways to show the things they wanted to show. Life in Lilliput, the capture of Gulliver clothing Gulliver, the king dancing with Gulliver's hand. If you just want to sit back and enjoy sort of a greatest hits of 1930s style animation with everyone dancing and moving and doing things that are weird in weird ways, there's a lot of that in this film, and it's generally very well done. Number two, the historical perspective cannot be discounted here. Whatever failures the film had creatively, narratively, technically, historically, this was the second feature length animated film and the first non-Disney one. That's a pretty nifty distinction, and it allows this film to settle into a little identifiable niche that cannot be taken from it. Now, I know that I would usually have a third pro to share here. Today, I do not. So, yeah. My cons. Number one, there was something really weird going on with the sound in this movie. The levels seemed to bottom out all the time before returning, so music or singing or dialogue would sort of fade away and then come back. It just sounded like bad mixing that wasn't corrected at the time. And for a film that was intended to be a response to Snow White, that sort of basic technical failure is unforgivable. Too much dialogue is lost to this bad mixing, bad recording, or a poor choice of character voices and accents. Number two, the split between the traditional cell animation and rotoscoping is jarring at best and flat out distracting at worst. It's hard to believe that the prince and princess of Lilliput and Blefuscu are actually the children of the kings, since they appear to be entirely different species of creatures. While Gulliver himself might look fine, even interesting by himself, being thrust into a world with very differently animated figures makes him stand out in all the worst ways. This film was supposed to show Fleischer Studios at the height of their powers, and the film we got comes across as a disorganized mess of conflicting artistic visions. Number three, the narrative shortcomings. The first 20 minutes are dominated with the tale of the princess and the prince and the two kings not agreeing on wedding details. And the words, there's a giant on the beach, are repeated dozens of times. But it's a full 25 minutes until we begin to get into the iconic scene where Gulliver is tied down by the Lilliputians. And that scene goes on for almost 10 minutes. So we are effectively halfway through the movie and nothing has happened. This is Gulliver's travels in name only, not in actuality and certainly not in theme. The film certainly belongs in the annals of not only the poorest book-to-film adaptations out there, but also in just narratively poor and disorganized movies. 
While I'm usually quite forgiving with films that have a special historical significance, I have a great deal of difficulty getting behind this one. It's not a narrative in the traditional sense, as very little story is told here. It's just more of an ongoing animation jam, like one overlong and nonsensical silly symphony cartoon. And while that might work for a 5 minute short, even a 10 minute reel, this is a 77 minute long feature film, and it tells almost no story. And what little story it does tell completely bastardizes the source material. There's a lot more to Jonathan Swift's satirical novel than Gulliver Big Lilliputian Small. And visually, the film frequently cheaps out by having simplistic starry sky backgrounds. And really, the whole thing looks very dated and quaint compared to Snow White, which came out two years earlier. This is a boring, yawn-inducing failure of a film that only gets worse the longer you watch it. And the ending where everyone seems to learn the true meaning of love or something is, is interminable. How it impressed anyone in its day and saw any kind of financial success is far more a comment on how little animation there was compared to the viewer demand in those days. This gets a don't watch from me. It's the longest 77 minutes you can spend watching this film, and there is no reward to make it even remotely worth your time. You're up. All right, so my pros. One, the length. Now, this is more common with the older movies, but I still wanted to give it a mention. A lot of movies nowadays are around two hours long or more. That can be difficult, especially if you're tired and just want to pop on a quick movie. I appreciate the older movies having that runtime be closer to an hour and a half because sometimes they can just be easier to enjoy. 2. The rotoscoping This made a visible difference. Honestly, I wasn't a huge fan of the large, overblown movements of most of the characters, but the prince and princess, and even Gulliver, were just easier to watch. They looked more natural, and their movements seemed more human-like. I'm a big fan of things like that being as realistic as possible, so I definitely enjoyed that here. I just wish it had been done to more characters instead of just those three, because they looked really strange when compared to the rest of the characters on screen at the same time. Now, same with Dad, normally I would do a third pro right here, but unfortunately, I do not have one. so. I'm just going to move on to my cons. 1. The singing. Why was there so much singing? I don't get it. There was no reason for random people to just burst into song in the middle of a scene. Or even worse, whatever was going on between the prince and the princess. Their interactions were awkward enough. They really didn't need to have them just singing their anthems at each other. The songs were all placed in strange parts of the movie, and they interrupt the the flow to the film. 2. The sound. It was all over the place and not great to listen to. Some things were just ridiculously loud, like the sound effect of the two kings licking their fingers. They made this huge popping sound as they took their fingers out of their mouths. It did not have to be that loud. And yet, one of the kings was so quiet that I couldn't hear half his dialogue so I didn't really ever know what he was talking about. The sound quality was just not great overall, and it was very inconsistent. 3. Gulliver The movie is literally called Gulliver's Travels. Travels as in plural. Gulliver should have traveled to more than one place, not just be marooned on one tiny little island the entire time. And considering he was the title character, Gulliver didn't do all that much. He was unconscious for, like, half the movie. I swear they spent 20 minutes trying to tie the guy up. And when he was awake, he just looked down on everyone and gave them these creepy smiles. It was kind of uncomfortable. Writing about this film was hard. I couldn't think of three pros for the life of me, and I didn't want to go overboard on the cons. I could think of three more cons just off the top of my head. I have to say, I did not have a great time watching this movie. I was struggling so much to pay attention, I missed key parts to the plot, so I didn't even know why some of the things happened at all. It was boring, slow, 
and those 77 minutes seem to drag on for 10 years. I have to give this one a don't watch recommendation. If you're looking for a good film to have fun watching, this is not the one for you. All right. So the double don't watch from us for Gulliver's Travels. And with that comes the end of another episode. How did you like it? Does this film belong in the conversation with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves? Is it unimaginable that it clobbered the Wizard of Oz at the box office? Let us know all about it in the comments. And be sure to come back next week when we wrap up our month-long look at animated films with something maybe a little more fun than Gulliver's Travels. So, basically anything. We could show anything at all. <laughs> we will find out. Yes, we will. But until then, be sure to watch more movies. And let everyone know about us. We're not a secret, and you do not have to keep us all to yourselves. So tell your friends. Tell your enemies. You never know. They might like dancing with the gigantic hand as much as you do. Maybe even more. For Sam the Sidekick, I'm Derek, and I love old movies. Additional research for I Love Old Movies, the podcast, is done by Nikki Weatherden. Audio clips come from freefx.co.uk. Images are used through the provisions of fair use, and our theme song, Burning Bridges, is by The Crocs.